The following is a presentation of the Healthcare Facilities Network. So tell me about the concept of the Velvet Glove of Leadership. It's, it's part of your title. What is the what is Velvet Glove of Leadership and what does that mean? Well, you know, there's a lot of concepts around, but uh, there was one that we talked about. You have to rule with an iron fist in a, in a velvet glove. And, and that just means, meant in my mind, my interpretation of it was, you have to be, you, you can't be wishy-washy. You have to be firm. You have to make sure that you're making good decisions. You have to communicate them well. But you need to do it in such a fashion Mm. that you turn people off your staff or your boss or your you know the nurse on the third floor um so you you've got to wrap le uh, you know leadership isn't easy i mean you have to fire people i talk about that in the book you know when's it time how do you do that uh you have to look for when is it time to fire dennis well that's a tough one man because uh, you know how you'll see something and in your mind, you'll kind of rationalize it. Well, that, that was because of this circumstance that this person did something. And, and um, you know, about the second time you see something, you need to start counseling that person. Maybe the first time you, you, you start counseling them, you do a, a, we had a step counseling in, in Catholic health, you know, a verbal or written uh, yeah. that sort of thing. But, um, I think the key for a leader is when you see some anomaly out there, you begin that process right then. Hmm. And if you do that written piece, and if it goes to, a, I mean, a, a verbal piece, and if it goes to a written piece, you'll know when it's time. And um, quite frankly, you know, I've, I've hired hundreds of people and I've fired, well, I've hired more than hundreds of people. And I fired a lot. And that's a, that's, that's, I don't do it like Trump. You know, I don't say oh, you're fired, but um, <laughs> I would, I would, I'm kind of shocked because about half or two thirds of the time, the people know they need to go. Mm. They know they're over their head. And, and you probably have experienced that. Yeah. Uh, maybe even more than that. And you always have that little tiny element of folks that, I didn't do anything wrong, you know, and they don't know, they can't comprehend uh, what they've done and how that impacts uh, people. So uh, when is the right time? Uh, you know, you, you've got to take a larger view. You know, you, you got to care for your people. I mean, they're everything you got without them, you're nothing, but you've also got in, in the military, we call a mission. And if you don't complete the mission, then there are bigger issues that happen. So you have to thread that needle and and begin immediately counsel somebody if they do something that's out of out of sync with what you or the or, what the organization or the goals are. And if they treat somebody poorly, I will tell you if uh, if uh, if I found somebody that was um, sexual harassment or that they stole or they you know there's some pretty egregious things that okay it's time you're out the door this is peter martin if you or your organization is interested in advertising or partnering with the healthcare facilities network including sponsoring content then please email me using the barcode in the lower right of your screen from the trades level to the vice president level from planning design construction project management compliance safety and security the Healthcare Facilities Network reaches FM people where FM people are. Uh, it's harder in big corporations because they have that stepped yeah. piece. But, you know, there are instances when you when you say, uh, I'm going to get security, we'll go get a box, and we're going to clean up, clean up that desk. Um, don't wait. Do not accept substandard performance. If you accept substandard performance, everybody will see that and that substandard performance is like cancer hmm. and it will grow i don't know if i answered your question there yeah no you did i mean because you know often there's not a black and white answer right i mean it's that gray area and i'd imagine 
as a leader, that's you you got to be comfortable operating in the gray because it's not always, you know, the answer is not written for you all the time. What did you what do you find, Dennis, throughout your career? And and actually I would ask too if it's changed, if you can remember, but as a leader, what did you find to be the most difficult element of leadership? And did that change over the course of your career? Wow. Um I I think I changed over the course of my career. Yeah. When I was asking that question, I was thinking, well, people change, so but you know, you, they're you, not stagnant. No, you have to be humble, I think. And uh, there, there's a, a big mix there. I mean, you have to be self-confident that, that you're going to be the person that can take this organization, wherever, whatever it is, and complete whatever task there is. You have to have that self-confidence. But if you don't do it, combine it somehow with humility where you understand um, what the people that you're asking to do these hard things, yeah. you know, what they're going through. You have to know that. And I, I was, uh, I, I was pretty fortunate in my military career. I started out as an enlisted person. I enlisted and I was a cannoneer on a howitzer crew, of, you know, 13 soldiers. And then I went to officer's candidate school. And, um, uh, when I came back as a lieutenant, I felt, I knew how those soldiers on the on the howitzer felt, and I think that helped me. Uh, you know, I didn't I didn't treat them like they were some um, piece of equipment that mm. didn't have didn't have a feelings. I had to understand that. Yeah, and I, I so I think that I think I changed. But anybody that comes in to a leadership uh, position starts throwing their weight around uh they're, they are they're going to alienate the people they need most yeah yeah did you learn that did you know that intrinsically or did was that a lesson learned over time i think it was learned over time i think i made mistakes uh i certainly did and uh they were painful uh, but uh, over time you know, uh, I'm I'm still not perfect. I, I, you know, I can still offend people pretty easily, and uh, I'm sorry for that. But um, it's a journey. I don't know if anybody ever completely gets there, but it, it goes back to the hero part of this thing. You have to study folks that have done it right, and and then say, yeah, I, I think I want to emulate that. Mm. You you just you talked about. Um you beginning your career in the military. And then you had mentioned Chamberlain a little bit earlier. When you were talking, I was thinking down here. So I'm just outside of Boston. I'm about halfway between Boston and Providence and Massachusetts. And down at the State House in Rhode Island, as you know, from the Battle of Gettysburg, Cushing and his battery were Rhode Island guys. And there's the Gettysburg gun in the State House um, yeah. down in Providence. And it's the it's the cannon that got hit. So it's the federal on the Rhode Island, the Rhode Island battery. They were firing at the day three at the wall and they were hit by a Confederate uh, cannonball mm -hmm. and the Rhode Island cannonball is stuck half in and half out of the wow. cannonade because it, it stopped. So that's what, when you were mentioning, it made me think of the, the brigade, but you think of, you know, talking about learning from history, those men were at that gun until the very end and right. gunned down right there. <laughs> There's a, there's a place called the Notch, and maybe that's what you're talking about, that that low wall. Yeah. yeah. There's a battery there, and man, I tell you, Rutherford, I think, was the name of the battery commander, battery commander, and it was all different back in those days. But they actually stood, the commander would stand by the gun, and they would say, move it left, move it right, up or down, that sort of thing. And, uh, and he was shot in the groin. And he asked his soldiers to, for a couple of them to help him stand up so he could continue to command that gun. Because if that gun went out of what they call out of battery, that means it's it's no longer in use. Um, that the, that battle was uh, in danger. So Rutherford was held up until he died, and mm -hmm. they finally pulled that gun out of battery. Uh, so. You know, you have to you have to hear those stories. You have to understand, hear that, and you think, what person, what kind of person, can can do that? 
and uh, and then you ask I ask myself, well, could I do that? Mm. And I don't know. You know, you don't know. Was it difficult for you when you were writing the book um, to to pare down? I'm imagining you're a guy who who likes history. You're probably well read. How difficult was it for you to take leadership principles and historical principles? You, you had that, you know, of a hundred pages you didn't want to go over. You went to hundred. How difficult was it though to pare that down and get it into a, a book and talk about it? it it's really hard. Uh, you know, I like books like Le Lincoln on Leadership. Uh, I like uh, uh, other books, and they'll take a topic and they'll develop it over the whole three quarter inch or one inch thick book. It's not going to work nowadays. Mm. So, uh, you know, I talk about Aristotle and knowledge is beginning of leadership, or not, or self knowledge is beginning of knowledge. Um, I had a friend of mine who was with me, and he was my uh, operations officer when I was battalion commander. And he said, you know, there's only two things you need to know in life. He said, you need to know what you know, and you need to know what you don't know. <laughs> and if you know what you know, and you know what you don't know, then you then you find out where to spend your time to, you know, fill in those gaps. So when I when I pared this down, I, I really had that purpose. I really wanted to expose enough so that somebody could say, oh, I know that. Or they could say, I don't know that. I need to learn more. And that that's... Uh, that wasn't the easiest job in the world to do, to tell you. Yeah. Right. yeah. You know, do you think that, and not even trying to get societal here, but we try to distill everything down, right? We try to we try to make everything simple and easy to understand, but the world doesn't, nothing where, you know, there are some things you can do that with, probably can't with leadership. What does that mean for the future if we have to, I don't want to say dumb things, but if we have to make things like easily digestible so you can get them in a one or two minute bite or three minute bite, whatever it happens to be, what does that mean for the future of leadership and, and learning and just everything that, and really evolving, you know, you've evolved as a leader, I've evolved as a person, we all evolve, but if we try to simplify everything, don't we end up losing some core components and what's the impact down the road of that? Well, I think you probably That's just probably why to... you wrote the book. <laughs> yeah. I, I had I had a great concern for my my grandchildren and uh, for the future of the country. I really did. Uh, I think if you go back, uh, you can probably find some historical uh, precedent here. This has happened. Uh, you know, I, I remember reading. That's what I love about history, Dennis. This has happened, and I'll say that to people a lot. Like we kind of think we live in this time and nothing like everything's unique. It's not things have happened before and you can learn from them. And, but we're not willing to do that. I don't think. No, we haven't had the pain yet. Um, I read the rise and fall of great empires. I think is what it was called years ago. And it talked about, you know, you look at Rome, Rome ruled the world. They were all, they, they had the biggest chunk of real estate that you could possibly have. And they collapsed. They failed. Uh, they got comfortable, and uh, that failure was, you know, that led to wars over and over again. So, what are the, um, in in your eyes, what are the the elements of leadership that you talk about in the book? I know you can't go into everything, but core. You've talked about communication. You've talked about listening. Are there others we haven't touched on? No, yeah, let me get. Let me look. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'd say I'd, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and write things down and forget them. Uh, understanding issues, that I think is, is uh, to do that, you have to have knowledge. You know, you have to have that technical knowledge to be able to understand the issues. Coaching and assisting others. That, that leader that said, I only want to talk with text, isn't coaching anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, coaching, how do you, you, you got to be concerned about who's going to fill your, your shoes here. And as an officer in the military, a lot of people don't realize this. You're only allowed to stay at a certain rank for a certain number of years, three or four years, and then you're either promoted or you're gone. 
So you're constantly growing your replacements, you know. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not coaching, that's huge. Uh, you have to be able to build a rational case for decision. Well, that means writing, and, you know, it goes back to the communication piece. You have to build up and encourage others because, you know, when the air handler goes down on the on the roof during a blizzard, you're going to have to be able to encourage people to get up there and put themselves at risk or in an uncomfortable environment. <clears throat> and recognition and awards. You know, you got to be able to understand that people have to be recognized for what they do. Um, some of the skills now really deal with being able to plan. And I, I have uh, some videos on strategic planning. Um, I think if a leader has a plan and articulates that well, then, and rewards people for following the plan, that uh, is a huge piece of leadership. And all of a sudden, you're not <clears throat> you're not concerned with every detail because you've been able to name these are the details, and you hand that off to somebody else, and and hold them accountable for their management of those details. And then you multiply yourself as a as a leader. You multiply your force. Did you find it difficult to um, learn <laughs> delegation to to get to that point? Was that was that hard or? or... Did that come easy for you? Well, it, I, I think for me personally, it came fairly easy um, because, uh, you know, any leader that thinks they have to have their finger on the thumb or their finger on the pulse of everything that happens and nobody can make a decision without their okay, <laughs> they're limited. They're limited on their on their leadership. You've got to find people. I, I tried to find people smarter than I was, and that wasn't very hard to tell you the truth. But I would hire people smarter than I was, made sure they understand what the issues were, give them some parameters, what I would call guardrails. You know, when you're driving down the highway, you had that the the white line in, on on the edge and the yellow line in the middle, and, and I'd say, you got to stay between these lines. You know, unless you're passing, unless it's safe to pass, and as long as you're between these lines, you know what we need to do. I don't need to know everything. Just tell me when the when we run into a problem quickly. Ooh, that's uh, and that's a learned that's yeah. a learned uh, uh, ability. You talked about when we started, you know, relative to when you hired in a Catholic Health Initiatives with Skip, and one of your first things to do was to na to nationalize the program. I have to, you know, as you were talking, um, you had to use to to go from to to implement that program. I'm sure it was difficult. You had difficult conversations with local leaders, local hospital. I mean, you're asking them to give up, give up control. Right. Ultimately, how did like how did those interact? And I know they were all different because you're dealing with a lot of people. But did you ever find yourself in that position where this hospital president or ho local leadership? They weren't swayed by anything that you presented, the, the, yeah. any of the data, any of the facts. Did you have to sometimes pull that heavy hand of leadership and 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 say, you know, this is what we're doing and, and you're coming along? I'd imagine that was a last resort. But did you remember some of those interactions you had? There, Yeah. And, and you have to remember, we were a Catholic organization. Um, it really started out as 11 orders of nuns. Okay. That... that folded their hospitals together and uh, there was no operational control. It was more of uh, uh, here's our resources. If you're, if you need resources here, we'll give you money back more than you put in and all that kind of stuff. So <clears throat> the leader, the organization as a whole uh, took a long time to start to move to an operational type of uh, environment where there was a, a hierarchy and um but quite frankly there were people that um pushed back so hard and and i finally had to say okay let me do what i can i'll help you out and then um hopefully i would be able to show them out of the hundred hospitals the number that i had at the time this is the benefit and and i can prove it i can prove this is what we've done 
and then it kind of puts them in a position where they have to have to really think again you know, whether or not they're going to participate. But um, there are times as, as a leader that you're going to run up against things that you have to decide one of two things. I'll accept that reality and do the best I can, or I will leave and go someplace else where mm -hmm. I can't impact it. And um, so, yeah, there we 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 didn't we didn't use a, a steel hand and a velvet glove. <laughs> 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 it would be yeah. the opposite of your velvet glove of Lear, the steel hand. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Um, you mentioned who were some. Um, I mean, we all can point to bad leaders, but are there any neg Are there any leaders in your book you spoke about? what not to do and 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 who were they well i i had a couple of personal experiences um uh, i like i say i was uh um uh, i got my commission at, in ocs so i'd been enlisted for a couple of years and um i went to officer basic in fort sill to learn more of this artillery to um uh, work how to do it better and we would always organize in the military. You always organize yourself in the in in the artillery and batteries. Otherwise, it's companies uh, and battalions and so forth. And uh, the uh, gentleman that was selected, we were all lieutenants. I happened to be promoted to a first lieutenant, so I had seniority over second lieutenants. The majority of them were second lieutenants. And the gentleman gentleman that was selected to lead that that particular organization was a um, a graduate of the academy, never been on the enlisted side, you know, and they'd live in this educational environment at uh, West Point, and then were promoted to a lieutenant when they, when they were commissioned. And it was interesting to watch because uh, he treated us, his peers, uh, as if we worked for him. And some of us outranked him. And that was a pretty rough period of time for him. And it took him a little while. And then he began to understand that if he didn't build a relationship, it was very difficult to get people to work with. Him. Mm. So, I mean, that was a, that was a kind of a unique experience. I, you know, a lot of people are not going to have that type of thing, but I bet you can, you can, you can find that same thing in the, uh, you know, if you're hired as a brand new facility manager and day one, you come in and start giving orders and stuff. I I don't know that it's going to go well for you. Yeah, you uh, know, so much of what you say. So I was obviously never in the military, but I was thinking back to the miniseries, The Pacific, that was on HBO 12 years ago now, whatever, however many years ago that was, that chronicled the, the war in the Pacific it was kind of the... Uh, the yin and the yang to Band of Brothers. Band of Brothers follows ZZ Company over in Europe. The Pacific didn't concentrate on a company, but it told various stories. And I read the books that the series was was based on. And two of the guys, Robert Lecky and Eugene Sledge, those books, the fighting, as you know, the fighting in the Pacific was just brutal. But Sledge and Lecky had both enlisted. You don't see it so much in the TV show because they can't put as much in it. But when you read the book, there, when they would get the guys coming out of West Point, coming over into mm -hmm. the coming into the war after ha having not island hop and experience what there was a lot of uh, the, a lot of resentment towards them. And they talk about them just coming and they didn't they didn't have that shared experience. And I was surprised to see some of that resentment that was in the books that these guys, they never said they never called the lieutenants out. They never told they'd always come up with a name for them. Um, but it was it was definitely there. These guys jumping in and they don't know anything. <laughs> That's right. And in Vietnam, it was pretty costly. You know, if they got a brand new lieutenant that hadn't been there in the fight, yeah, and, uh, he was telling them to go out and do this and that, or, and and without understanding the consequences, uh, sometimes the, some bad things happened to them. They got fragged, uh, where their own men um, mm. took care of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that can happen in a civilian life. I mean, not that you're going to get blown up or anything, but you can be sabotaged. That's for sure. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, you're, you're, you're not fighting in a war, but they, people can be equally as, you know, uh, 
trying to get you back. So Dennis, as we I appreciate your time, author, Dennis Smith author, the velvet glove of leadership in the 2020s, leadership principles that don't change in a changing world. Anything we didn't cover. And again, it's kind of a unique book because you have the core, which is your book, but then you have information that people can learn more on YouTube. So it's almost like a flower opening, right? You got the book at the core and then the petals, but is there anything we didn't cover or anything relative to leadership you think is important to leave, leave folks with? Well, first of all, I'm amazed that I ever wrote anything because my <laughs> seventh grade English teacher would just roll over in her grave right now. But, um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's like, uh, you just have to take this book and and take it a page at a time and and say, uh, yeah, I need to learn more. And I've done part of that already with the YouTubes and, and the toolbox. Um, I have a website that will be that will be live soon that's going to link all of this stuff together. And I'm going to uh, continue to add to the videos with what I call three minute tune ups. And I'll take, you know, short subjects three minutes cram a lot in uh, my my daughter the uh, history teacher says no more than three minutes so um there's a lot we probably haven't covered but i don't know that we can in sure. an hour. and uh, i would just here's the thing you know as people as people think about this um there are things in this book that even seasoned lo lo seasoned leaders will say oh yeah i remember and i need that tune up a little bit but if you've got a grandchild or you've got a child that was born after 1997 it's titled leadership but these are skills every one of them needs yeah. and the and the truth is almost everybody's going to be a leader of something sometime you know um yeah, I I think that this is this is the first step on a long journey for people that that lead it and, and appreciate it or read it and appreciate it. They appreciate. It. Oh, where do people? I know you said Dorrance is the publisher, and I'll put all this in. But where can people go to buy your book? Uh, DorranceBookstore.com, and I'm in the uh, nonfiction business, and you might have to scroll through a little bit, but I will send you Peter a. QR code that takes you directly to that um, uh, place to purchase from the publisher. Uh, online, I've had some people I think have bought uh, eBooks on uh, Barnes and Noble or Amazon. Excellent. Well, Dennis, so, good luck and and thank you for your time. Hey, I appreciate it, Peter. Thank you very much. And I appreciate it. This is Peter Martin for the Healthcare Facilities Network. As always, thank you for tuning in. And